Church, today we're going to look at the life of a man who is at the heart of the Christian story. And yet, he never says a single word in the Bible. His simple acts of obedience are his speech. Today, we're going to look at the life of Jesus' earthly father, the guardian of the Messiah, the man named Joseph. You know, our scripture reading is going to come from the beginning of the New Testament, from the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to front load our scripture reading this morning, and I want to walk through two passages in Matthew to get us started today, and we'll put these verses up on screen, and just follow along with me in your Bible or reading up on the screens with me. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 through 25, and Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 through 18. Here we go. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law, and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Verse 20. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When, Jesus, when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Okay, now chapter 2, verse 13 through 18. Follow along with me. When they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said. Take the child, that would be Jesus, who's now born. Take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night, and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son, verse 16. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping in great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more reading of God's word. Amen. Church, I have been deeply moved while preparing for this message on Joseph's life of faith that we see in scripture. And today we're going to look at Christmas through his eyes. Here's a, here's a man who every nativity set we see has Joseph in it. He's at the heart of the Christmas story. I think if I was able to welcome Joseph up here with me today, and if I could interview him for us this morning, if I was to interview him, I think if I was to say something like, Joseph, what was that first Christmas like? Can you tell us, looking back, what that first Christmas was like? I think he'd say something like this. If you want to know how God's peace comes into the world, you have to realize it will bring a lot of difficulty and detours into your life. Also, the work of God may look small and weak, but it's actually the strongest thing in the universe. 
Also, we need to live in the tension in our life of faith as we follow Jesus. The tension of the remarkable, the miraculous, and the ordinary. And finally, I think Joseph would tell us it all comes down to obedience. That's Joseph's message to us this Christmas. Let's unpack that a little bit. You know, I think that we've made Christmas a little bit airbrushed in the 21st century. But Christmas, the, the first Christmas, it was messy. It was so messy. Can you imagine the story? Joseph and Mary, I mean, here they are, like any young Jewish couple engaged to be married at the time. They hadn't had sexual relations yet. And, and then all of a sudden, Mary is pregnant. She's with child. And the angel says, don't worry, you're actually pregnant through the Holy Spirit of God. Can you see Mary responding? Okay. Um, let me tell Joseph about this. Uh, Joseph, um, I'm really looking forward to our life together, and um, can you imagine? Um, and can you imagine what would be going through Joseph's mind as she's saying the words? Well, Scripture tells us an angel shows up to Joseph in a dream and says, listen, this was of God. Call the child Jesus. He's going to save people from their sins. And here we are in the 21st century, and we're like, sweet. That's what messiahs do, right? They save people from their sins. That's easy. But at the time, you were not saved from your sins by a baby. There was a temple. There was a priesthood. There was a sacrificial system. And so here's Joseph. He obeys. And then here's Joseph honoring God and being obedient and and then Herod shows up and he wants to kill all the babies that pose a threat to his rule and his reign. So an angel shows up to Joseph again, again in a dream and says, I need you to take the child Jesus and his mother Mary and flee to Egypt as in immediately, like go now in the night and so Joseph takes Mary and Jesus and they flee into the night to Egypt. You know, in the intertestamental period, Alexander the Great had set up a Jewish community down in Egypt of over a million people. So they could have taken the gold and the frankincense and the myrrh that they had been given and, and go down to Egypt and live off that as they were refugees while Herod tragically carries out the massacre of the innocents. And the thing about this passage, church, here's the thing about this passage that we read. I'm grateful for the Christmas story unairbrushed. Un I'm grateful for this Christmas story because it shows us that the way that God works in the world is the way that we need him to work in our world. Amen? God comes into the messiness of this world and he changes everything. Because our world is no less messy than the world that Joseph lived in. Let's think about Joseph, the man, for a moment. In Joseph, we see a man that God chose to parent his own son. A man accepting God's unexpected direction in life, without resentment, full of obedience. He was selected to be the guardian of the Messiah. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, mentions that he was a descendant of David. Remember King David from Israel's story? He was, however, let's face it, he was an ordinary guy from an ordinary place. People knew him as the carpenter. His days were filled with hard work. And we see that he treats Mary well. He gave her love. He gave her protection. He cared about her dignity. So what is Joseph teaching us about peace and how it is found? What is Joseph teaching us about our faith as we look at his life 2,000 years later? Is there a lesson as we look back 2,000 years to the earthly father of Jesus? What does Christmas look like through his eyes? I've got four word pairs for us this morning from the life, from the life of Joseph. And the first word pair is this, number one. Detours and difficulty. 
If we look at Christmas through Joseph's eyes, Christmas, the coming of God into the world in the person of Jesus, the peace of God coming into the world through the Prince of Peace, here's what we see, detours and difficulty. You know, when God shows up, there are usually detours involved and difficulties that we never expected. Wait a minute, is that what we're supposed to hear in church? When God shows up, there's detours and there's difficulties. Somebody say amen. That's not what we want to say amen to, is it? Yeah, more detours, more difficulty in life. Our normal situation goes out the door when God shows up. We're busy following our cultural scripts, and we think that uh, these cultural scripts that we're following will lead us to success and lead us to security and The peace of God doesn't always lead us in those directions. We see this in Joseph. He had a normal life. He was probably hoping for a normal life, (laughs) right? And a normal life is not what the angel came to announce to Joseph. Joseph found himself in difficulty and encountering resistance all of a sudden. Do you know our faith is a spiritual resistance. And being a part of a spiritual resistance is going to bring spiritual resistance. Christmas, ultimately, is a threat to the principalities and the powers and the systems of oppression in our world today. So when God comes into the world, his peace brings different directions to things. His peace often wakes us up from whatever sleep we've been lulled into in life, and Christmas changes things. We can't have a sentimental view of the first Christmas. We we can't sentimentalize the peace that Jesus brings, and we need to see that a life of faith means detours and difficulty for every one of us. Doesn't sound like much of a sales pitch, right? Hey, come be a part of a life of faith. It'll bring you detours and difficulty. You know, I wish I could tell you that saying yes to God means smooth sailing from here on out. But it doesn't. It wasn't smooth for Joseph, and it won't be smooth for you and me. What's the second thing that we see from the life of Joseph? First, detours and difficulty. Number two, Surprise and paradox. The life of Joseph teaches us that our faith will be full of surprise, full of things we didn't expect, full of paradox. You know, paradox, a seemingly absurd or self-contradictory thing that when you investigate it or explain it may prove to be absolutely true. The peace in the Christmas story seems so small and weak. Look at, a, look at a nativity scene in your mind. What's at the center of it? A little tiny baby. The peace in the Christmas story seems so small, so weak, but it's actually the opposite. Not only is the peace of Jesus not weak, it actually gets stronger and stronger and better in the midst of hardship. If you look at what happened, it's staggering. An unwed teenage girl and her confused fiancé are in a war with the greatest builder in, in the Roman Empire at the time. It's the kingdom of Herod and the kingdom of Jesus. Who would you pick? Who would you pick? A vulnerable child or the might of Rome? Old Testament prophetic promises from hundreds of years prior from obscure prophets or the propaganda machine of the Roman Empire. It doesn't seem possible to win. But church, the wisdom of God is better than the wisdom of men. His way of working in the world, rather than getting weaker, although it starts weak, grows stronger and stronger while the strength of the world, although it may appear to be strong now, grows weaker and weaker. And this is what we see in this story. Confusion 
at first turns to conviction. Shame turns into salvation. Persecution turns into the peace that passes all understanding. Joseph teaches us that what we have is not weak at all. It looks weak, but it gets stronger and stronger no matter what is thrown at it. Thomas Merton, one of my heroes, said in his book, uh, Thoughts in Solitude, this great quote. I'm going to put it up on the screen for you. He says, and sooner or later, if we follow Christ, we have to risk everything in order to gain everything. We have to gamble on the invisible and risk all that we can see and taste and feel. But we know the risk is worth it because there is nothing more insecure than the transient world. I love that. Let me ask you this morning, what is God up to in your life that right now looks weak? It looks small. It looks like it doesn't stand a chance. But like Joseph, let's see that small thing that God is doing in the midst of the mess as actually powerful because it's the hand of God bringing surprise, bringing strength in your life. Surprise and paradox. Number three, if Joseph was, if we're looking at Christmas through his eyes, we're going to see a life of faith that is both remarkable and ordinary. Remarkable, miraculous, and mundane, ordinary. Looking at Joseph, we see faith is about the remarkable and the ordinary. This is a phrase that Frederick Buechner, an incredible writer, uh, incredible Christian writer, he uses this, book, uh, uses this idea in his book, The Remarkable Ordinary, wonderful book, that addresses the tension that we all feel in our faith. It's another, it's another paradox, I suppose. It's the tension between the supernatural intervention of God through his miraculous power that we all long for and the tension between the miraculous power of God and the long hours and long, hard days filled with normal work and the human experience. You know, in the Christian life, we have both the remarkable and the ordinary. The miraculous and the mundane. Some people want miracles and the supernatural all the time. That God is a miracle-working God. And some people want that miraculous every single day, which is just exhausting. Or on the other side, there's people who have no expectation of the miraculous in their life, no expectation of the remarkable. They just want to try to get through life. Our faith is what Frederick Buechner called the remarkable ordinary. If we could just get a hold of this. I think Joseph did. We have remarkable moments, church, and the ordinary is always close at hand. Amen? But listen, our faith is miraculous. It's, it's everywhere. We have to resist the rejection of the miraculous in our life. Every single one of those stories two weeks ago on Cardboard Testimony Sunday, those are miracle stories in miracle lives because of a miracle God. And we need to resist the practical deism that denies the miraculous in our lives. However, our faith is also ordinary, isn't it? Church, are you there this morning? Our faith is ordinary. Here's the tension. Amazing things happen in our lives followed by Dozens and scores and scads and epochs of normal, boring days. And this is one of those tensions. We have a faith that is remarkable and ordinary. Remarkable and ordinary. Remarkable and ordinary. We have to acknowledge that miracles are possible. And we have to find God in the ordinary as well. I mean, God said to Joseph, you're going to have to flee to Egypt. But he didn't appear to him. Uh, he didn't appear to him while Joseph was awake. He appeared to him in a dream. 
It's like a remarkable ordinary. And, and you know, he didn't, he didn't swoop in. The angel didn't swoop in with a chariot of fire for Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus, which would have been remarkable. He, he said, get up and escape in the night, which is terrifyingly ordinary. I think Joseph would tell us, if you're looking at Christmas the way I saw it, it was remarkable. And it was, it was kind of ordinary. We have to live in this tension because God is ultimately committed to repairing the world, but he is also ultimately committed to forming his people, to forming you and me. And sometimes if God fixes everything for us, there are massive areas where we are spiritually immature and underformed. So God is working to form you and me, and he's working to form our lives in the remarkable and in the ordinary. Let me ask you, are you in an ordinary season today? Are you in a remarkable, miraculous season? It takes both. And the fourth pair of words that we see from Joseph's life that speak to us today are these, obedience and obscurity. Obedience and obscurity. You know, it's astonishing. Joseph never says a word in the Bible. His obedience is his speech. You ever meet somebody like that? You have immediate respect for him, right? He gets up when he's told to. He marries Mary when he's told to. He names Jesus as he's told to. He takes his family to safety in Egypt when he's instructed to in the way that he's instructed to. His life is a life full of obedience. We often think it's the really big things in life that count. But in Joseph, we see it was these simple acts of obedience. Who else would God choose to be the guardian of the Messiah than someone who knew how to obey? It was costly obedience. It cost him his convenience. It, it put his reputation at massive risk. Joseph was obedient. He was also obscure. You know, even though he's in the middle of this nativity scene, we don't know a lot about him, right? And it seems like maybe later in Jesus' life, maybe he's passed into eternity and we don't hear much more about him after that. There's an obscurity. Even though he's there, even though he's present, even though he's obedient, there's an obscurity about Joseph. There's a beautiful film uh, called A Hidden Life. It's a long movie. Um, came out just a few years ago before the pandemic. And it's based on a true story of an Austrian conscientious objector during the time of World War II and the mounting pressure that he faces to swear an oath of loyalty to the Third Reich. And he won't do it. He won't do it. And ultimately, this man, this Austrian man, he's imprisoned. And a local priest comes to visit him. And the priest says, look, God doesn't care what you say with your mouth. It only matters what's happening in your heart. And this man is facing so much pressure to cave, to compromise. And he finally says, a man worth anything has only one thing to consider, whether he is acting rightly or wrongly. And a Nazi soldier pushes him and says, do you imagine that anything that you do will change the course of this war? That anything outside of this court, that anyone outside of this court will ever hear of you? No one will be changed. The world will go on before and you will vanish. And then he's executed. Church, let me ask you, does your obedience make any difference? 
does mine. Joseph's did. It mattered. Your obedience and mine matters too. That movie ends with a beautiful quote at the very end by the writer George Eliot, whose pen name, that was the pen name of Mary Ann Evans. And we're going to put this up on the screen for you, and I want to read this to you. The growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts. And that things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been is half owing to the number who lived faithfully a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. The growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts. And that things are not so ill with you and me as they might have been is half owing to the number who lived faithfully like Joseph, a hidden life and rest in unvisited tombs. Church, we are called to faithful and often hidden lives. Yes, you and I, for the most part, will live hidden lives. And no one, or very few, will visit our tombs. I'm not being dark. It's just the truth. But these hidden lives preserve and extend the kingdom of God in the world. Joseph's life shows us both an obedience and an obscurity. Both of these are part of our inheritance as the people of God. We know precious little about Joseph, even though he was Jesus' earthly dad. He lived a life that is seemingly hidden and beautifully faithful. I'd like to invite the worship team out. And as they come, I want to talk to us just a little bit about responding to God this Christmas season. So as the worship team comes out, I want you to, I want you to just track with me here. As we lean into this Christmas season, Joseph would ask us, are we ready for detours and difficulty? And so I want to ask you this morning, are you ready for detours and difficulty? Are we ready for surprise and paradox this Christmas? Are we open to a faith that is both remarkable and ordinary? Are we willing to be people of obedience and people of obscurity? God's probably not going to fix everything for you but he will give you himself. <laughs> and that will be enough. And that is what Christmas is all about. He's not gonna fix everything for you and he's not gonna fix everything for me, but he gives us himself and that is enough. So as we head into this Christmas, I don't know what you're facing. In a room like this and joining us online, there's probably people who feel like they're doing wonderful. And there's others who feel like the bottom has fallen out of their lives. But we all need grace. We all need his peace. We all need his presence, his mercy, his hope. Can we just have a time of response where we invite him in? At the beginning of this Christmas season, Whatever you're feeling, whatever you're experiencing, let's invite him in, if you would pray with me. God, I'm open to peace. I'm open to your peace in my life. God, I'm open to the detours and the difficulties that may come. God, I'm open to a faith that appears weak but gets stronger and stronger in adversity. 
God, I'm open to both the remarkable and to the ordinary. God, I'm open and ready to live obediently and to welcome obscurity. Just meet with God for a few moments in the silence. Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters today as we head into this Christmas. Lord, that you would meet us with your joy and your presence and your life right where we are in the reality of where we're living today. We love you, Lord. Thank you for that first Christmas. Thank you for this Christmas that we're heading into today. We trust you and we thank you, Lord, for Jesus coming into the world. And everybody said, amen. Hey there. Thanks for watching Living Word Community Church's YouTube channel. You can click to watch our most recent message and hit the subscribe button so you never miss a video or a live stream. We look forward to seeing you soon.